Welcome, everybody, uh, to this Serenity and Leadership uh, panel discussion on the subject of rejecting empowerment, the rise of women's autonomy. So my name is Tom Dennis. I'm the CEO of Serenity and Leadership. And just, just to sort of briefly say, the, the reason I, ch I chose this subject was I, I was in discussion with a, um, a, a woman the other day, and we were talking, uh, well, I raised the thing about uh, empowering uh, women. And she got very irritated with me and said, I, I'm, I'm perfectly capable. I don't need any empowerment. Uh, I, I have my own strength within me. And it, it, it raised a, a, a sort of a question in me about um, how people are, are perhaps falling into a trap, a trap of, of condescension uh, or feeling condescended to. Uh, um, and whilst there's an awful lot of positive intention around empowerment, um, I think some of it doesn't necessarily come from that positive a place and actually has a negative effect rather than a positive one. And, and that's really the, the purpose of this conversation is to explore that. I'm joined by a wonderful uh, panel of, of professionals in the DEI facilitation, neuroscience and executive coaching spaces. Lynn. L Lynn is, um, I saw the other day, she's a, you're, you're a former All-American swimmer. I am. <laughs> <laughs> Acknowledged trailblazer in the DEI sector. You're a, uh, Lynn's an accomplished business strategist with extensive experience in leadership development and organizational transformation and is dedicated to fostering a 21st century workforce that truly uh, reflects our diverse global society. With a background in executive coaching and talent management, Lynn has helped numerous organizations optimize their human capital to drive business success. Richard. Richard's a, a seasoned HR professional with a passion for fostering inclusive workplaces and empowering diverse talent using real alignment, renewal, and rejuvenation as the three pillars of his work with a background in diversity and inclusion initiatives, and also a, a, a very solid involvement in, in men's uh, work. Uh, Rich has played a pivotal role in driving cultural change within organizations to create environments where every individual can thrive. Over the course of his life's journey and work, he's learned that it takes a particular combination of heart, mindset, and skill set to keep sustainability work flowing and reviving it when required. Helen, Helen, welcome. You, you, you're, you're, in, uh, you're in Cyprus, a, a clinical psychologist, a neuroscientist, and renowned wellness expert. She raises people by re rewiring their brain and beliefs, inspiring outstanding insights and increasing their visibility and network. With a holistic approach to well-being, Helen combines ancient wisdom with modern practices to guide her clients on transformative journeys of self-discovery and personal growth. As she says, she who, she who has magic needs no tricks. Mm. Ali. Uh, Ali is a, a, a dynamic entrepreneur, change agent and advocate for women's leadership and empowerment. With a background in business development and strategic partnerships, Ali has spearheaded initiatives to support women in achieving their professional goals and breaking barriers in male-dominated industries. Her professional mission is to create work environments and partnerships that nourish talent, cultivate innovation, and commit to excellence. So that's this amazing team. And uh, what I would do is, in the context of proposal, I guess, of rejecting empowerment, uh, in favor of autonomy, I uh, just invite each of you just to say an introductory word or two. So if I can start in the same order, Lynn. Um, to be honest, I work, well, 80% of my clients are women uh, and they're women in leadership roles, top leadership roles across public and private sectors. I personally have not encountered any women who weren't very happy to be empowered in this day and age. Uh, and uh, I feel that um, 
it's how you do it and how it is accessible to them. And to me, it's about accessibility. Uh, and I feel that women have it, have the opportunities there, but they often think it is not for them. Uh, we often do not, um, we water down our ask, we question why opportunity shows itself to us. And uh, we sometimes, you know, we suffer imposter syndrome uh, and we have crisis of confidence, but at the same time, we are amazingly fierce. We're more able than most. Uh, and I think that empowerment is often saying, look at yourself in the mirror and understand your value and what you bring to the table. And I think without saying or using the word empowerment, it's about just saying, sit and reflect and understand your signature strengths and what they add to the big picture and allow yourself the opportunity that those strengths should present and know that they are those opportunities are for you and they are yours and you may take them because that is what is right. Thank you. <laughs> You put your stake in the ground. <laughs> so, Richard, how about you? Well, Tom, you and I know each other because we met through um, the participation in the, in the delivery of a program called the Mighty Heart. And, um, you know, one of our discussions, this topic of empowerment came up. And I and you, and you said, would you like to join the panel? And I said, yes. And, <laughs> um, and then when you called it rejecting empowerment, I thought, wow, that's spicy. Um, and I'm a, I have a background in, in languages, you know, and um, because for me, empowerment, like transformation, it's it's an inside job, you know, it's, it's um, so that's one of my beliefs is how, more like how can we understand empowerment, embrace it and, you know, uh, create spaces for it. Uh, is it a rejection? Maybe that's what we'll get into. Maybe it's is rejecting a particular relationship that we've had with with it and therefore a misguidance and a mis, um, misdirection and i do think language is important i think it's um it, it only tells one fraction of the story and that it so directs our attention you know we've, we've already had reference to magic and there is there are spells in the spelling of our of our words um and i think we've got to be really careful with how we create our consciousness through the through the words, you know, abracadabra, you know, with, um, I think it's true, it's, it's meaning is um, uh, with these words I create. Mm -hmm. So um, that's perhaps a slight tangent already, but to say that I think empowerment could be really powerful if it was understood better as an inside out job and something that was encouraged, enabled, supported, rather than, I don't know, treated as, as with other words, treated it as some kind of stick to hit ourselves or each other with you know what if it was a garden that one feels invited into thank you um helen thank you tom what a beautiful launching pad already we've got some really great things going i'm really intrigued by some of what's been said already about accessibility in an inside out job I did some posts about this and really came into more and more truth in my own path about the deception I think a lot of women sometimes have about their own power and their own ability to take opportunities and also the conditioning behind that. And that's what spurred on a piece of research for me, which is really the place I'd like to come from today because it invited me into a deeper conversation about what happens beyond feminist narratives and what is beyond feminism? What is beyond empowerment? What is the problem with empowerment? And I, I think quite right um, in what's been said already that we have a way of perceiving things, which is a conditioned mindset often. And so my journey as a psychologist has been to understand that perceptive field, how it's constructed. And obviously there's a social and a psychological and a biological and a family origin and a cultural and a geopolitical influence to how we perceive who we are, what we're about, what we take, what we leave behind, what others 
uh, give us, you know, there's all kinds of issues related then to the next level of study, which is identity. So how do we construct our identities and how does conditioning affect that? So for me, empowerment has become a complex place for us to begin to relate now to what constructs our perception of it, how it's played out, how it works behaviorally, and, and what is the trickle-down effect really, the practical uh, outcome of it. So in that research, it's very clear um, that I needed to get more involved then with what I'm now calling legacy and then spirituality of women. Because there is a very strong discourse around why we don't have the perception that we have power and why we've had to voice uh, the voiceless through empowerment rhetoric and narratives. And so we mustn't forget that because some groups do not have accessibility to power and empowerment is just like any other situation in life. It has a polarity. So we can go into a community and think we take skills there, but actually that means we're saying that that community doesn't have skills in and of themselves. And there's been a lot of critique about that kind of colonizing people, groups, communities in that way. So empowerment can also colonize female form to say females don't have power, of course. And I think we're going to get into that. So I just want to respect that there is a polarity between these things. And that doesn't mean it's all bad. We just have to look at what's working, what's not working. And uh, like uh, Richard so, so poetically said, um, you know, the inside out job part of it is a very, very important insight that I think we already start off with. That's, that's important to, to keep returning to. Thank you. Ali. Yeah. So I'm, uh, I really resonated with the reaction of the, the person that you were speaking with um, and, and in, in the very specific context. So being told you're empowered, I have always experienced that as a very polite way for someone to tell me they outrank me, but they're one of the good guys. OK, um, and I've come to start to look at it a little bit differently. And I look at empowerment now as a platform and they're the things that we put in place in our environment. So those could be policies, um, attributes of the culture that we create and that it's about creating opportunity um, and access to opportunity. And then I think of autonomy um, as being able to make decisions and choices that are well suited to me specifically. So I'm going to say, and as a female in the workforce, I want both. I want to have an amazing platform where we are continually making opportunity uh, available to people. But I also want the opportunity to have autonomy where I'm tailoring that to my specific skills, lifestyles, and, and desires. So I think of it almost as empowerment's the suit and autonomy is being able to take it to the tailor so that it's a perfect fit for me. And that means maybe having time, um, ownership of my schedule, um, deciding how I work, what clients I work with. So those are kind of key things that I think of as part of, as part of the discussion. Um, but I do think it is important how we use language um, and telling people they're empowered is in fact saying there's some outside force, um, whereas autonomy comes kind of from within. So I really do agree with that outside inside work. And then there's always a, a question that I ask um, uh, uh, female leaders who, who I work with. And I always say, someone gets to do it. Why not you? And the challenge is answer that accurately. Maybe you're not qualified, but then find out. Right. And it's it's not letting all the noise, uh, you know, confidence, those things come in. But someone gets to do it, whatever the it is. Why not you? And really hold yourself to answering that accurately. And if you have a great work environment, you have tools and resources to help support whatever the answer is to that question. So those are my initial thoughts. <laughs> Can I just ask a, a quite um, simple question? I mean, how many of you have actually had someone actually say to you, you're empowered? <laughs> you, so, Ali, I, you said that you had. Helen, Richard? I wouldn't say people have said that, but people do think 
of certain people as more uh, able to access things and i have had that put put into me onto me yeah why do you ask uh, what's there about that? i think it's a funny thing to say to someone um you're empowered uh and i don't think anyone would say that to me because they wouldn't question it. And that's a very personal thing. Uh, I don't think you would come up to me and say that. But I think that what you mentioned about legacy and how, how you're socialized, how you're raised, all has to do with that. It's like confidence. I can't give you confidence because confidence comes from within. But I can show you what it looks like. Um, and there's a difference there. And I feel the same way about empowerment. I think part of empowerment is how you believe, how much you believe in yourself and your ability. I like what you said about believe the opportunity is yours. And if it's not, why not? That makes sense to me, Allie. Um, you know, to know why. But I often find that women in particular do not feel the opportunity is for them and don't feel that they should go for it when clearly they should. And I can't give you that, but I can show you what that looks like. And I can show you what that looks like as a black woman, but that comes from the way I was raised. You know, as a black woman, you're born at the bottom of the totem pole. We don't ask for that. That's just fact. That opportunity is not present always for us. But that doesn't mean that we, you know, aren't empowered. That's a very personal thing, empowerment. It is very personal and it comes from within. And I do believe that anybody can have that. And I think that autonomy, what you're talking about, it's about, it, it, like you said, it's how you use it or you decide to use it or not use it. And I guess that comes to the crux of it, really, because, uh, and as Richard said, everything's in the language, really, because the, the sense that I hear empowerment is, as, as, as Helen kind of described, is I am somehow superior, therefore I am going to put you in a position where you feel um, bigger that, or more capable than perhaps you do already. You, you, you know, Lynn, you say it comes from within. I, when I hear empowerment, I hear it coming from without. And, and, and actually autonomy uh, is for me much more the, the, the within. I mean, perhaps we're just talking about semantics, but the, the, the languaging of these things uh is 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 just so important and i i do have a sense that from, from a from a men's point of view quite often this this the, the the talk about empowerment is somehow a a task that a man has got to do to 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 level up in some sense uh and you know the the, the what's going on for the individuals could be completely different but somehow that's the frame that I perceive. And from that point of view, I think it's, it's not very helpful, but that, that, that may be very rare. You know, Lynn, you say all your, the women you work with are, are very happy to receive some empowerment, but that is a, that again, that's an external thing. But I didn't say receive. I, I, I think to be, <laughs> given the opportunity the to examine their own, their own, you know, what's inside, what's there already, that maybe needs a little a reawakening or mm -hmm. uh, accessibility or um, exploration. But often it's there. It's just not recognized or acknowledged. That is what I have seen in my work is that it is there. But it needs to be accessed. Absolutely. I'm not giving. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't think there's any assumption necessarily that 
um, women don't have it within. And uh, there's t an awful lot of people would say, well, men are much more aggressive in the way they, they go for jobs, for instance. Uh, uh, women tend to hold back. If there's one aspect of a job description they don't feel they can do, they wouldn't apply, whereas a man will say, the hell with it, I'll go anyway. Um, so that there is, it, it, it is, I think, the whole question is how do we draw out of people that all of them, not just what they feel might be acceptable or something like that. I don't know, Richard, you look very thoughtful. What, what, what do you? Uh... Yes, well, um, I just, by the way, something I just really want to acknowledge because I really felt it strongly when Lynn talked about black women at the bottom of the totem pole, that really, um, I can't, that felt painful. That, it was painful to hear. Um, um, and there was something uh, that you were saying, Tom, about, you know, from the outside in. I don't, I, if, if, let's say if empowerment is an inside out job, I think what we can do is recognize that there are external structures and processes and cultures that make empowerment bloody hard <laughs> you know they get it gets in the way of a natural process of a human a human process of i'm going to go back to my garden analogy actually of a seed you know you know breaking through the soil and flowering and, and spreading its goodness and its color and its you know into the world and and we've put in place things that are disempowering in the sense that they make empowerment bloody hard and i think what the you know i'm generalizing here but i think it's a fair generalization that um the existing processes and systems highly favor men who are white and of a certain age as well actually you know so although and i i think it's to ali's thing about both i think it's really important that we have the conversation about women and not in isolation you know it's 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 both it's it's um this is really important and i part of the reason i'm here is because i feel it's an important movement that is best driven by women because of everything that's been shared already and that innate sense of power and it has to be supported by men because it can't be done in isolation mm. And the tricky bit for men, I think, is dismantling the external structures that keep things very cosy and comfortable. And thank you very much. Well, you are, I mean, I, I agree with you 100%, but, <laughs> but I don't, I know I'm blunt. You know, I'm not even going to try not to be because that's just not who I am. Uh, but, you know, I'm a well educated woman who's had opportunity. I do not question the opportunity that comes my way unless I feel I'm being set up to fail. I think that we have to have that mentality as women that if I spent my time worrying about who is entitled and empowered and the men who have the power, I'd be wasting a whole bunch of bloody time. You know what? I'm about, I'm going to take that opportunity and I'm going to put my hand behind me and I'm going to grab another woman that looks just like me and we're going to go through the door to the top table as fast as we can because this world is not fair and i don't have time to question opportunity like that i know i'm capable if i'm not capable i'm not going to go for it so we could talk around it all we want but i feel honestly the chips are so stacked that we really just need to action a lot more than talk. <laughs> I, uh, so I resonate with that. And I think at some point, let's stop admiring the problem. And, mm. and I feel like that's a big part of, of what we're doing in a lot of these, of these uh, sessions. So for example, we're just getting through Women's History Month. And I was looking at all the um, speaking events and things that I've been in, invited to, to either listen to or participate in. And, and then I was thinking about segments of, of my workforce. So I have a very um, young segment 
uh, of the workforce on, on, on one of my international teams. And I, I take great pride in that, but I also really force myself to think about what's the special care that they need, these people who are entering the beginning of their careers. And I was counting up the topics. And so I had something like 17 presentations on imposter syndrome. Uh, there was over 20 on confidence. Okay. Now I've been in the tech work world going on, you know, almost three decades, right? So obviously I had hundreds and hundreds in the tech space. But when I think of my young people who are starting their career, if the first things we're telling them is that they could possibly have imposter syndrome or they have confidence problems, I wonder if in the structure of saying we're being empowering, we are doing exact opposite with our junior people. I mean, they need, they need to opt in right? Get the skills. Great managers with young people allow them space to try things they're not qualified to do, help them fix the mistakes, and then push them back into play. That's what great leaders do for young people who are starting their careers. You know, so I think we want to be really careful um, and really segment our workforce on what are the messages that they need to hear. And what the biggest message is should be not why me, but why not me? Exactly. Someone gets to do it. Why not me? Why not me? And I'm ready. I'm able. I'm empowered. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm going to fly in with a little devil's advocate here because I think um, one thing I want to stand for in this conversation over and above uh, dismantling the problem in the way we're using the words and, you know, blindsiding ourselves into thinking that um, the word is not necessary is to really put a, put a little bit of attention on the cultural aspect, which I think we can't all speak on because of our own prejudices and biases and preferences and social backgrounds. So perhaps uh, understand more about what is creating the need for empowerment in certain people that don't feel ready to activate their power is a very important place to consider the value of the word because there are communities, there are cultures. I live in one example, uh, which is not such a good example, but it's close enough to a good example because it's an ancient civilization, 10,000 BC, that has had Uh, many different cultural groups come into this island, and yet still women are conditioned to serve the community a little bit more than they serve themselves. Now, this is an interesting aspect in the psychology of why empowerment began, is because there is this idea that women uh, on a profiling psychological scale are actually more agreeable than men. This is quite a famous argument put forward by Dr. Jordan Peterson, a Canadian psychologist who talks against feminism, which is what opened me up to have to dig much deeper into what are we doing when we talk about women not having power and the patriarchal system being a problem. And, you know, are we just rewriting problem after problem after problem and getting attached to the problem? Like I think you were saying, Ali, are we not glamorizing the problem, right? Um, so this, that's fair enough and good to say and very important to look at because that's the blind spot of empowerment work and the blind spot of women also feeling like they can do the job and sometimes going into what's an opposite to imposter syndrome, which is something I write about called the Kruger-Dunning effect in research, talks about how often sometimes women might actually go into a kind of glamorization of power as though they can do the job better than men. And we've seen a lot of that as well in society, a way of kind of inflating the ego or the identity uh, at a place where then it's very difficult to know where your true value lies and what your true skill set needs to be in order to get the job done. So it's great hearing um, that we now have covered both of these sides. You know, where is the real power in a woman? It's not the same for someone living in uh, Kazakhstan as it is to someone living in Kenya. Role models are very important. We don't have, um, you know, all the same level of influence in our societies. Mm -hmm. If you have a whole bloodline that has, you know, let's say always had the primary breadwinner be the male father of the family unit, 
and all of a sudden a woman starts to overtake that, she loses very specific social standing and social respect in certain cultures. So one thing perhaps we can do is just be aware of generalizing across all cultural and uh, kind of social political uh, spectrums because we are not all the same and we don't all have the same need. It certainly I want to add on also trauma. This is a very, very big point. I don't think we realize how many gender-based violence uh, moments create a very specific rupture in female confidence. Mm. And this is something we don't talk enough about. We don't know how to talk about it, quite frankly, because, again, we've sort of, you know, uh, assume that women's bodies are just uh, vessels to carry trauma silently. And we don't really know how to work that through evolutionarily as a species. We're not doing a great job. We still minimize the problem. We generalize the outcomes and we say you know, we're doing it all over again in the way we go to war as a species. And we haven't learned from previous examples. And that creates an entire generation of mothers who are going to have a ruptured, many of them, I don't want to say all, all you know, but a ruptured sense of self and a sense of violation in terms of what power really is and how accessible power really is for them in terms of even being able to protect their own bodies. So I think um, I just want to go on the map speaking for the voiceless in that in that regard and say that, yeah, perhaps we need to have different points of view about how we empower and who we empower and why we empower as opposed to having this word be like a general umbrella term for all women to activate power because it's very different for a woman to be activating from within knowing that she has possible outcome because maybe she's seen one role model out there versus a woman who has an autoimmune disease after you know years and years of being um, uh, minimized or abused or diminished and not knowing how to handle that and then it manifests as a, as a medical condition um, many many different so, different folks. Um, I don't know if any of you would um, like to comment a little bit more on, on what you see in the empowerment work you're doing when it comes to trauma histories in those women, because perhaps that's a link we need to think more about. Uh, I think you brought up some really good points, um, Helen, and I concur uh, with some of, with, with most of them, to be honest, because it is different for everybody. And certainly we cannot, you know, make sweeping generalizations. But there is something that you said that I thought was very, really resonated with me. And that is um, women being conditioned and brought up systematically to think that we should serve, that we do right. not put ourselves first. And we do not put ourselves first. We are conditioned to not put ourselves first, which immediately puts us behind the eight ball for a lot of reasons. When you don't put yourself first, you know, you end up uh, running yourself down you take on too much. You put everybody's needs up before your own. And before you know it, you're, you're, you're spent, you're burnt. Um, and, and that we see that happen. We're seeing that happen more and more you know, every day and women are leaving the workforce in droves because they're burnt out and because they haven't put their needs first. So this is something that we do share. Um, and, and, and I know that that is a generalization, but I think that that's, that's a fairly accurate general. We are, we are raised to believe that we should serve. Um, and the other thing that you brought up, I thought really thought that is so spot on is that we don't know how to talk about it. We don't know the way we speak to each other. And I, and I go back to Ali saying, you know, we've got all of these me this messaging that we're giving out, which is just not exactly the opposite of the message that we should probably be giving out and touching on. And, and we don't, we, I think because power is very male centric that this empowerment conversation and talking about things like imposter syndrome and or uh, diversity, equity and inclusion, they're all framed around, I, I feel in a lot of ways, making white men feel better um, about having the power or and feeling benevolent, giving power back or sharing power. Uh, and I just think it, I feel 
uh, I don't want to say I feel angry, but I definitely feel like, you know what? Talk is really cheap. Talk is cheap in, in, in the sense, in that way, in that sense, consistently sending these messages that, oh, you're an imposter. Who, cre who created imposter syndrome in the first place? Why do women have imposter syndrome in the first place? Really? Like, why? Because some dude said we're not good enough to have the power. Well, some, sometimes, we sometimes uh, power. what I've seen is that it's because a lot of the time women feel like they're not good enough. And that's a deep seated, ingrained. It's ingrained. It's systematic. Many, many override that. Many can override that. They become really powerful leaders in their own right, but they have to override it. It's not really yeah. inbuilt easily it, that no, we are good enough. Second sex, we have been for decades, aeons. We've had to pull back our personal desire for social desire, for family unit progress. So we know how to put that part of us on a back burner and that gets rationalized as, well, we're not what we need, what we want is not that important or we're not good enough really. So we have to override that. That's a piece of psychological work to do. I think there's it's a huge piece. It's a huge piece that yeah. it's, it, you have to you have to have the data and the proof in front of you to believe that you are not an imposter. And often it is emotionally driven, not fact driven. And and if you sat and you looked and you had your achievements in front of you and you realized you had very specific achievements that you could not refute, they are based in fact and evidence you would realize that you're not an imposter. And I think that's one of the ways that you, you can actually go, look how powerful you are. You, it's like getting a review and you focus on the three things that were negative instead of the 10 things that were positive. How can I fix that? No, no, it's like, don't worry about fixing that. Play to your strengths. I think we just get really, our focus is warped. And it, I think it is warped by society. It's deeply ingrained in the fabric of our society. It is warped because often by trauma, life experiences, um, things that we are told, our ego state, our parent ego state, our child ego state, all of those things come into play that hold you back, keep you down. But they're designed to keep you down. And I think they're designed by men to keep you down. And I think that mm. that is historical. I think that is the way society has worked. So I, I think this um, takes me on to this, this thought about, well, okay, where do we go from here? And I, I, I noticed, Lynn, as you were talking um, uh, a few moments ago about how you didn't say this, but essentially you were saying, I am empowered. You know, I go out, I get it, you know, I, and, and there's no question that you, you come over as a, as, as highly empowered yourself. Um, and I, what I was noticing is, it, it, is this isn't just women who've been conditioned, men have been conditioned too. And uh, so my conditioning, I, I, I think, uh, was slightly intimidated by the way that you were um, speaking and uh, which, which then makes me think, well, yeah, how, how do I deal with this? Uh, as, as when I see a, a woman who is in, in a sense coming over more empowered than I feel. So I, I just want to, want to name that, that there is another side to this. I don't know, Richard, wh whether you, <laughs> you, you, well, you, uh, You've Very nice a, input, Tom. I'm think, I think that's really great to name. Go for it, Richard. I'd love to hear. <laughs> well, was Ali, Ali, were you going to say something first? You know what? Yeah. I, I was going to just jump in. Um, so one of the things is I think these issues, they, they go across gender. OK, so, you know, I was literally at a conference talking with this guy and he's from Stanford. and He has all these accolades and whatnot. Right. And he's, he struggles with confidence and we laugh and we go, he's amazing. Right. Yeah. So I think this is kind of an internal dialogue that happens across genders. And right. I think if we can 
you know, we can't we can't change what has historically been done. But that's why I like to look at empowerment as a platform. But it's a platform that works across genders. And I think that's what our, our focus needs to be. I, I know historically it hasn't been fair and, and all of those things, but that can't be the focal point moving forward. And uh, and, and men have to be part of the solution. Uh, and the conditioning and, and, and the culture of the environments that we're setting up. You know, um, I was asked um, in one of my organizations to, um, to, to kind of run what they called a, a women's initiative. Um, and they looked in consulting and they said, wow, we lose all our women at about manager. Why is that? You know, they don't go on to become partners and things like that. And I said, I'll only take that role if you give me um, a peer male counterpart. Because us having a conversation in silo um, may give us some some relief as individuals, but my experience is it doesn't change the environment. Uh, and so I do think it's really important to involve men, but also to understand their interior world too. So we might be conditioned to say they have all the power. That doesn't mean that's how they sit down seeing themselves at the breakfast table. And men certainly do have imposter syndrome and crisis of confidence, just like women. But what they are conditioned to do is not show it. They're, they are conditioned to hold a front. And like that, like, like you were saying, Tom, about when women apply for a job, they want to tick all 10 boxes. And men, if they tick three or four, they think the job is theirs. And that's, that's a fact. You know, that's data backed fact. But I do think that... You, you cannot, we cannot do this without male allies. I do think there are many male allies out there who want change and that are proactive about change um, and, and, and are completely engaged. I think it's more that men sometimes see this uh, as certainly confidence and um, imposter syndrome more of a women's issue uh, and that they can figure it out. Maybe we'll throw a learning, little bit of learning and development towards that, but you know that'll tick a box. But that 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 place that you were talking about, Ali, which is that crucial place, that broken rung between management and getting into the XCOM, that really comes from the lack of support. That comes from not understanding what women need at a crucial point in their careers and not being given the learning and development opportunities that will make them feel that they are powerful. That's where the breakdown really happens. That's the, that's There's a great deal of evidence supporting that. That's where we lose it. And we lose those crucial older women, middle-aged women with life experiences and with... Um, job experience, professional experience, because they're unsupported through the menopause and through um, change. And it, it, we just break it down and we think, oh, a little learning and development will tick the box. That'll do the trick. But it's not the yeah. understanding and the connection. I, yeah, I, I resonate with that. But the one thing I want to add is it's about content. So it's not about a little learning develop learning and development. But here's the difference, right? Everyone can have confidence issues. But when we're trying to train leaders, what I've noticed is a difference is um, men teach men the business, men mentor women in confidence. Yeah. Absolutely. That's a big gap. So when Absolutely. we understand who's getting to the C-suite, it is content and competence and the transfer of that, that we're missing out on. Absolutely, absolutely, and and PNL opportunities, which we know you have to have if you want to get to the damn C suite. You know, yeah, we like we're managing the work, but not the budget. So, <laughs> I, I want to I want to bring in Richard now. Sorry, Richard. No, no, sorry, sorry, Tom. <laughs> sorry, Richard. No, no, it's all good. I think I actually, you know, a broad brushstroke would, would be that if, if men really want to support women. Um, then they need to do the men's work. They need to do the work. They need to take um, personal responsibility. And I think that also there is a something different that happens when, I mean, I want us to do all this work together, you know, across all genders, but I think there's something specific that one, one can do uh, men with other men. And I think, um, you know, in traditional cultures, men grew 
most healthily from from boys to young adults and beyond when they were role models when they could be um, witnessed by other men and given uh, direct and honest feedback and mm. so I don't want to overstep the mark here but with 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 Tom saying what he said, for example, it's like, how did, how could that be held with respect? What, you know, his sort of, hang on, well, this is what it throws up for me, acknowledged, right? And then when he is supported to take, to the, the, the man, Tom or another, is is supported to take responsibility for that pain, whatever that pain is, I'm, I'm generalizing again. Because I think, and you know, there's a, there's an expression I've had a few times in, men, in men's work that, um, you know, if a man doesn't deal with his pain, then everyone else does. You know, and I think we've built entire cultures uh, based on that. It's like an infection, something that's gone viral um, that wouldn't have happened if there was that male to male support in the first place for what I find tends to be um, um, emotional insecurity. So, where I know we can do generalizations, but where, where the the physical trauma, what Helen was saying about women not feeling safe in their own bodies is, 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 is huge. Uh, I find I come across men who don't feel safe with their own emotions. And so guess what? They get covered up and they, they and then the emotions, the emotions have to go somewhere. They're still energy. They're still there and they spill out. They either go inwards as disease or they go outwards as dysfunction. I would, I mean, again, I'm generalizing. So coming full circle, I think men need to be supported to take responsibility for their own shame and guilt that is repressing their anger. And it's, I mean, I'm, you know, I know I'm seeing <laughs> generalization, but there's kernels of truth. There's kernels of truth. And I think when we can embrace the shadows of our psyche, particularly something like self-doubt, you know, and when we can turn and face it with inquiry, something lies beyond it there's always a there's always a gift that lies behind the shadows of our of our discomforts and our, um dysfunctions but it's, it's been able to do that accompanied, you know, using lynn's um word ally you know it's 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 men allying other men so that they can then be better allies for women yeah i'm so glad you're saying all this but like popping here in my seat like popcorn you know because i mean the truth is I've had this discussion with Tom when we first met and we did our, our first chat together and it, it was so pressing at the time. And I remember even through COVID, so many people talking about, um, because I run a platform, Woman of Truth, which works a lot with integrative health leaders across the board, bringing more women's wisdom to the world about health, wellness and, and many things really. And at the time we were seeing so much exacerbated anxiety, you know, domestic violence, uh, with women at home during lockdowns. And I remember having all these online live discussions with many women saying how we wanted more men involved and how we want the allyship. And we spoke with Tom about it. And when I hear you saying it, I'm burning to ask you, what do you think is the tipping point though? Because in my experience so far, um, like you say, men are so conditioned to have women carry the emotional uh, intelligence, I'm going to say, of the, 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 the relationship or the community or the family. And the men are much more in the action of doing and in providing and protecting that it's, it's a really big shift to make. And I've seen just in my career, very few men make it. Mm. Very few men make that shift. <laughs> and very few men are inspired and motivated. It takes a really long time. And, and at times, much is sacrificed for that to happen. I mean, there's a lot of collateral damage before it happens. So I'm starting to go into deeper layers of inquiry about what is making, what is stalling this so much? Is it just a, a kind of a, a conditioned way of being? Or is it just really not that possible for men as a collective? Because... It's been talked about for a really long time now, you know, feminism and pushing, you know, the male gaze back and getting, you know, more women on board that are not intimidating, you know, and trying to like ally with men. It's been going on for a really long time, this discussion. So the amount of people really coming on board to be able to sit together like we're doing today, you know, 
is great, but I don't think it's close to a tipping point. Do you have any insight on what can take it a little further? Because well, I'm there's... starting to lose <laughs> there's something there's something that, that we have been pushing um, for, for a while it's uh, and that's this this idea that in, in a lot of organizations there's there's groups for all the quote minorities and, and I put women in, in in that category as well but there's almost never a men's group and the the reason uh, is because men are in the majority, largely, uh, and there's there's not a sense of a need, and yet in society uh, th there are far fewer now opportunities for young men to explore and understand themselves in the, the company of other men, as, as Richard has sort of highlighted. So I really think that um, organizations need to have men's groups where actually men can come and explore what does it mean to be a man today in this world which is changing just so fast? Um, and how can I be a, 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 quote, real man? What is my role today when I, if I look around, women can do everything? That, you know, so, so in a sense, what I've been brought up to believe is that, you know, I have a, a unique role in the world. It's gone. And so I, it, for, ha, for men to have a place where they can begin to reflect on this and speak in a, in a safe environment. And Richard, I know you do a lot of this kind of work um, it, to, to sort of defuse some of the tension and to enable them to, to touch into some of their emotions. And then we can begin to have uh, groups where men and women come together and talk about um, power and what empowerment means, what autonomy means. Um, but learning from each other, I think there is an assumption that, you know, I don't know, that, that men somehow know what to do. And I don't think they do. Richard. You've been positioned like that in society. That's why there is an expectation. So, Tom, do you really think that men can feel useful without having a usefulness to women? Because I think psychobiologically, that's always the stretch point, that the more women appear capable, and I think at the deep root, this is why we are struggling to reach this, and that's why... The question is, can that shift? Can a man evolve to a place, and I see it as evolution, where there is not a need to be needed only to have value, just like women have to also evolve beyond the need to serve to feel valuable. Yeah? I, I don't know. Richard, do you want to have a go at that? Um, I'm loving the question. I'm loving this inquiry. I really hope it can continue um, because I know – uh, you'll probably want some closing comments soon, uh, Tom, but I'll try and keep it brief in response to your question, Helen. I've probably got the pessimistic, you know, your question about tipping point. Pessimistic, personal and optimistic. The pessimistic is it won't change until it hurts enough. You know, it's the dog sitting on a nail howling and it's, why is, why, why is the dog howling? It's hurting. It's the planet is you know, hurting. The world is hurting. Because it hurting. It's hurting. So that, that's one. Personal. 9-11 uh, triggered a, this kind of rage inside me. It was an, an, an rage that came up through my legs. It was embodied, it was physical, and it triggered a whole, again, inquiry for me, which is, well, what's going on? But what the hell is going on in the world? And what's my part in it? Okay? That led to an absolute dismantling of what I thought my life was about, which created a space for, well, what could my life become? Right? But it's, it's an ongoing, actually, in dismantling of identity. But part of this driving force is this enrage, this, uh, enrage, which I would describe as feminine. It's something, it's, it's sort of between, it's between me and earth. It's between me and my, where I'm from, really from. And so I think for men, it's actually to tap into this feminine enrage, probably women too, and, crit, and bring it out as a healthy outrage. A healthy outrage and this is where my optimism is when anger is primary it's very clean it has very clear boundaries and it has a very strong stand for what 
um, is right, as in right, as in just, you know, as in fair, and whatever, I suppose, around your own values, okay? And I, this is where I'm optimistic, is when something lights up inside us that says, I'm going to stand for something different. And that's something that men can do. They can make a stand. They can say, I stand for, not I do this in my job, I tap away on a laptop, I, you know, move money around. Um, sorry, I'm being slipping into my own judgments there, I know. But, <laughs> but what I'm saying is, in your, you know, be, become purposeful as men, become purposeful from the inside, not as some job that you were told to do at school. Ah, so, yeah, I really love what you're saying. It's really profound. Thank you. So um, we are drawing, we are drawing to a close, as, as Richard has highlighted. So I, I think um, we have just opened some boxes. We knew that that's probably all that we would do, but it's been a, an incredibly rich conversation. So can I just ask you to just to very briefly uh, say what you need to say to, to close? Um, Lynn, can I start start with you? Well, I'm I'm back on Richard. <laughs> I'm just just thinking about what he said because I think it was very um, insightful. But I think the biggest thing that I, I would say is that um, we really can't make progress without the people who are really in power, who hold the the lion's share of power involved in that kind of change, that kind of fundamental change. Um, and I do think that this wave of change that we are on, um, that this, this movement, even though there's pushback and populism, I don't think that this change, this tide will actually um, stop coming in. And I feel that the more we have um, the collective spirit to create change and the more people who hold power understand the value of change and sharing power and empowering others um, the more likely we are to see a positive result um, i'm half hopeful um, because i'm a half glass full person but uh, i do think it's a dark place out there hmm. I, wish Lynn, I, had, I wish i had i wish light to, to to shine on it mm, thank you ali how about you yeah um i actually have a very positive outlook i mean i i i wake up and i i look at the world and as many problems as it has and as many distractions as it has um i think today it is possible um and, uh, and I think between tools and I think the fact that we're even having this conversation and we're having this conversation with a subset of people who are in all different places in the, in the globe, right? Uh, you know, I, again, so I, I guess my, my final words are, it is possible, but let's keep finding new ways to move the ball forward. Like we have to kind of step out of the box. And then my final, request would be a call to action get in play not just observation and 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 like i tell I, like i tell my my juniors on my team someone gets to do it why not you hmm. thank you richard <laughs> I'm, i guess that's how i'm feeling i'm feeling very lit up and sort of calm i'm feeling very inspired by who's on this panel and the ripples that we can each send out into the world. Um, I'm just going to stop with that because if if if, we, if we're doing it, it's we we are we are being part of the change. We are, you know. Um, sorry, I'm not feeling very eloquent. I'm feeling incredibly stirred up in a in a in a good way. Um, and I but I also and I believe that if we are having these conversations, there must be good things taking place. Um, mm. I wish. I was more eloquent than that right now, but um, that's what I've got. Thank you, Helen. Well, the fact that Richard, you are not for me is a sign in itself that something has shifted emotionally in the man on our panel, one of two, which is also very, very uh, symbolic and very profound for me. So, you know, some things are, are not said with words. I want to just point to what the ancient mystics used to call the soul of the planet as the anima mundi, 
it's a very beautiful idea that the planet itself is a female energetic uh, being that provides life for all of us and as such it is a sovereign being it is it is all giving all generous very much how we also see the mother archetype or the mother idea inside the feminine which we can all embody and that's why i love so much what we've said today about each of us feeling also connected more to a future we want to create and so if we can tap into that we can see a much higher cause a much bigger reason for why we need to get our stuff together and why we need to get on each other's side men women children you know east west north south dark and light like all of it comes together um and for me, I've been very uh, empowered and love to share it with others by the idea that we are the ones we have been waiting for. I really believe that. We are born in a time of great change. I see powerful transformation around. I see also reality and dark spaces like uh, my colleague here, Lynn, is saying, and also the real positive po uh, prospects that um, Ali is saying as well. So I think it's all included. It's how do we become more integrative in the way we think about things? How can we also know there's diversity in the world and there's great synergies in that? It's a beautiful idea, this emergence theory that talks about that, that we are emerging ancestors of the future, to borrow that term from Mitchell, which is, is always for me, uh, become a standing point for what we are all here to do. Those of us that do see change ahead, that want to be pioneering that change, we are all very needed. If you're listening and you're one of them, you know, I would love to connect with you and know more about how you're doing that. I think we are all very important um, uh, proponents of what the future can be. And focusing on what we want to create, I think, is much more helpful than looking back and saying what's wrong. So what, what are we here to create? And I think we are busy doing that. And thank you so much, Tom. I see us doing this once a month, if you want, where we can really move forward. So there you go, challenge for you. <laughs> Bring on new people, let's keep it going, because that's how we create that new paradigm. And thank you. Um, yeah, uh, we've, we've started tentatively on, on this. Uh, the, the next panel is is uh, in, in two months time. and. It's actually um, about the D DEI backlash, um, the pushback that mm. people are experiencing. But, you know, I mean, we, we, can, we can continue this conversation in some way. Um, I'd, love, I'd love to do that. And for, the, for anybody out there, I mean, we're a couple of minutes over, but if anybody finds themselves in a position where they need to change, and let's face, let's face it, most organizations do need to change. Um, if they're moving towards or striving to create a vision, a vision or to establish a, 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 their purpose beyond just making money, um, then we'd love to support you uh, to achieve those aims. We've got amazing associates out there um, who, who we bring in to, to, so the right people are there to, to attend to these things. Um, so I really encourage uh, people, if they'd like, to give me a call. And um, or you can you can uh, catch my diary and just book some time and then let's talk about some of these issues. How, how do we create a men's group in an organisation? How, how do we empower um, our, our women uh, better? Because not everybody's doing it awfully well. Um, uh, so um, thank you, everybody. It's it's been amazing, Ali, Richard. Helen, Lynn, your, your input's been so impactful and so there's been so much wisdom in, in the experience that you've expressed. So thank you all. It's been amazing. Thank, <laughs> thank you, Tom. You. Nice meeting thank all so of you. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Really good. Thank you so much.